Good morning. Good to see you all this morning. And uh, it's always nice that we can kind of come out of the world and gather as God's children and, and gather around the truth of God's Word. Um, I don't know about you, but, you know, I look around the world, and uh, unfortunately there's too much information we have, but, you know, the Bible says the times are evil. And I don't have to look very far in this world to see that that is, is definitely true. And it can become very confusing, too. So, so as we gather this morning and, and we gather around the truth of God's Word, my hope and my prayer is that God would somehow be able to use my insufficient and inadequate words to communicate to you and illuminate your hearts and minds and souls with His truth. And as that occurs, you would be a reassured and you would feel and know and experience that you are immeasurably loved by God. And so immeasurably loved, it's beyond your wildest imagination. And that, that's my hope that will, will occur this morning. And, and as we start this morning, I, I'm going to ask something a little different, particularly this is kind of different for me in the way that my body works and my brain works. I'm going to ask that, that insofar as you're capable, as we're talking through this, I'm going to ask, what are you feeling? I know we think a lot, but sometimes we as Christians, we kind of negate and, and dismiss our feelings, which are just as real as our thoughts. And to th this morning, and you'll, you'll see as we go along, I'm going to ask maybe, insofar as you're capable, can you, can you get in contact with your feelings? And, and as we start, one thing that I need to kind of give you a sense of, of where, what's going on in this time, you know, you know, the Romans are in control, right? And they rule with an iron fist. They can do and say whatever they want and you cannot. And then there are these religious leaders who are very oppressive to people. They would be oppressive to us. They profit for themselves, but they don't help us. They don't help us who are hurting and living and struggling in life. And, and, but we belong to this many generations, thousands of years of people who have this God thing going on in our lives. I mean, we, we know about God and we've heard about God we have these promises of God, and every year we do this thing called the Passover, and we do it without fail, and, and we have this belief that, yeah, we're living now, but there's the kingdom to come. And we believe in that promise, and we've been told all these prophecies by our grandfathers and our fathers and our mothers, and it's part of who we are, and we're, we're waiting for this prophecy to come true for thousands of years. And that brings us to today, Palm Sunday, what we call Palm Sunday. And um, let's look first at John 12. Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raped from the dead. So on a previous occasion, Jesus was in Bethany, and Lazarus was dead, and Jesus raised him from the dead. So they made him, capital H means Jesus, a supper there, and Martha was serving, but Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Now, what's not in this text, but is in, in the other gospel text, meaning the other um, um, stories of Jesus, is that this house that they're in happens to be owned by a guy called Simon the leper. You know why they call him Simon the leper, right? Because at one point he had leprosy, and now he doesn't because Jesus had healed him. And they're in his house. Remember COVID? Remember what it would have taken for you to come to my house if I told you I had COVID, you know, even after I was healed, you know? This is leprosy. Leprosy is a death certificate, and it's a really bad disease. You know, if you get it, you're sent out into the, somewhere far away to keep you away from people because it's also very contagious. And it's in that house at one point in time, and now we're in that house. And with us is Lazarus who's the guy, maybe he was our neighbor, maybe he was our friend, maybe he's the brother of, of our friend, but we know Lazarus, and we saw him buried. And he, I, I, on the way to work, I walked by his tomb after I saw him buried for a week. And now he's there with us in dinner. And we're having this dinner that Martha had made, and Martha's like the hostess with the mostest, right? I mean, it would have been a really good meal. It's like going to Sylvia's house. I mean, there's a really good meal going on. And this house is going to be clean and in order, and you're going to have a really great meal. So, insofar as you're capable, you're in this house where leprosy once was, 
there's Lazarus, and there's this meal. Oh, by the way, you remember what it was like back then, right? People didn't bathe regularly. They didn't have electricity. I mean, imagine the smells, right? But there's also the smell of food. And I, I'm not sure what the food would have been. I'm sure it would have been like some grains and, and some barleys and other kind of stuff, maybe some lamb, I don't know. But can you imagine what it's like, irrespective of the food and the smells, being in Simon's house, and there's Lazarus. Can you imagine that? So let me ask you, if you can, what's going on with you at that dinner table? What are you thinking? What are you feeling? What's going on? Anybody have any thoughts? You might be in awe. Okay? Anybody else? Sorry? Afraid, right? He was dead. Now he's here. I don't get it. And I didn't have the privilege of the Bible reading it afterwards. It's like right there. He's alive. So part of me is going to be afraid. Any other thoughts or ideas? Confused. Yeah, right? This is weird, man. This is some weird stuff. Anybody else have any thoughts or ideas? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Hallucin, yeah, I'm a, I, this can't be real, right? But it is, and it's very, very weird. Now, on the other hand, remember what I told you, these were people who knew about the kingdom to come. Much like you and I are waiting for the second coming of Jesus, or we think about heaven, they had this thought, and when they're seeing this, and it's weird, and it's scary, it's, oh, this is awesome, but all this stuff's going on. But one of the things that's going on in their mind is the kingdom to come is happening right now. He's healing leprosy. He's bringing people out of the dead. I mean, this is it, man. It's happening right now. And guess what? And when it's fulfilled, Jerusalem is going to be the center of the world. And guess who's going to be on top? Who's going to be no longer under these Roman guys, no longer under these religious leaders? We're going to be top shelf. John 12, 3. Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume of nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Now, we're here in this weird thing going on and all kinds of feeling stuff going on and then all of a sudden there's this smell. Now, nard was olive oil-based perfume but the spices that were introduced to the olive oil came from India. So that was a very expensive thing going on. And it says here the feet, but when you look at the other gospel accounts, Mary's pouring this on the back of Jesus' head and on his neck, and it's running down his body, and it's so much so that it's on his feet, and she begins to wipe it with her hair. Now what are you thinking? What's, what are you feeling? Now you know Mary, right? I mean, you knew her to be kind of a sweetheart, but this is something else. And you know that that's kind of one of the things they do to kings, right? They anoint them in oil. What are you thinking? What's going on, right? This is kind of weird, too. I, uh, we were kind of, I'm just trying to get used to the idea that that guy was dead, and now he's here with me sitting at the table, and all of a sudden this chick's pouring hair, oil on the, Jesus. Anybody else have any thoughts or ideas? But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, now, we knew Jesus had some followers, right? And this guy, he's one of them, who was intending to betray him. Now, he's given us some foreknowledge here. We don't know that at the time. Said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to poor people? Anybody think that's a reasonable question? Why not? I mean, come on. That's a lot of money. 300 denarii was equal to one year's income. Think of all the good we could have done with $300, and why is she wasted it on Jesus? Now, he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put into it. So, again, we're getting a kind of a 
retrospective look at, at this guy Judas and realizing, well, he's kind of a, he's kind of a turd, right? Stealing from the, the church box. I mean, funny story, but no, I won't tell you. <laughs> um, Therefore Jesus said, let her alone that she may keep it for the days of my burial. For you always will have the poor with you, but will not always have me. Now Jesus gives this weird answer. So what you have to appreciate here is what is Judas really saying? He's accusing Jesus about not caring about the poor. It's not about Mary, it's about Jesus. And he's saying, you obviously don't care about the poor because you would have used that 300 bucks for something good. And Jesus gives him this weird answer. And the weird part of it is, remember, these are people who are thinking, it's happening now. The kingdom to come is going to occur. We're going to be Jerusalem. We're going to be on top. And what does Jesus say? Uh, oh, we need to go back one text. Leave her alone so that she can keep it for the day of my burial. That kind of doesn't fit into my idea that it's happening now. But I don't really catch that because I'm just so elated about it's happening now, even though there's all this weird feelings going on and Mary's doing this weird thing. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. But wait a minute. I thought the kingdom was coming. And if I'm listening, I might be a little confused even more. I'm not getting this. So, again, imagine you're in the room, and all this stuff's going on, and then this weird conversation happens, and if you really listen to what Jesus is saying, he's going to die, because he's going to be buried, and he's not going to be with us for very long. That doesn't fit into my understanding of the promises and the kingdom to come. And some of us might even think, chill, Judas, we're having a good time here. Why are you so serious? Why are you poking at this guy? Could be all kinds of thoughts going on, I guess. John 12, 9. The large crowd of the Jews then learned that he was there. And they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. So, imagine if you weren't in the room, but you were nearby, and you had heard about this guy who was raised from the dead, might you go check it out? I mean, if I told you, like, oh, you know, yesterday in downtown Houston, some guy was raised from the dead, wouldn't you, like, I'm going over there, check that out for sure. It would be interesting. But the chief priest planned to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. So here we have a dose of reality. All these things are going on. And on the one hand, we believe that the kingdom to come is happening right now. Yahoo. On the other hand, well, I'm confused by everything that's really going on. And then the reality of these religious leaders is saying, we got to get rid of these guys. We got to get rid of Lazarus too. This Jesus guy, we've been talking about it for a while. We got to get rid of Lazarus too, because people are starting to believe in Jesus. Now, remember what I just said. They're believing in Jesus in terms of, oh, kingdom to come is happening now but I don't get all this weird stuff. So do you think they really understood what was going on is my question for you. And I'll ask that one rhetorically for a moment. Did they really get it? That sets the precedence for us to, to now look at Jesus' so-called triumphal entry that we talk about. John 12, 12. On the next day, the large crowd who had come to the feast, so it's Passover time, and if you were a good Jewish boy or a good Jewish family, you would go to Jerusalem for the Passover at least once in your life if you could every year. But you always went to Jerusalem because that's a holy place. It's a big deal. It would be like a huge family reunion. All your cousins, I mean, everybody's there. And when they heard Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, so we're in Jerusalem and we hear this Jesus who had raised Lazarus from the dead. And we heard a bunch of other stories about him also. He's coming and we're thinking, yeah, maybe it is the kingdom to come. So what are we going to do? First, please. Took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. So again, 
Had we been a couple of miles away or nearby, we heard of Jesus coming to join us in Jerusalem, and we think that it's the kingdom to come, it's happening right now, we might go out and meet him, right? And the palm branches is an interesting thing, and what you have to appreciate here in that culture is that the palm tree was considered the ultimate tree. It lived about 200 years, and it was a symbol for eternity. It was a symbol for salvation. So that's why they brought palm branches. Palm trees were a really big deal. Now you have to also appreciate in this particular text, can we put it back on that same John 12, 12? Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So when we do Passover, we would do this thing called the Hallel. And that involved us singing, chanting Psalm 113 to 118, which I know you all know, right? They did. And it was part of the Passover. And the first two days you would do this Psalm 113 and 118 fully. And then the last few days of the Passover, you would do half Hallel and you would chant this Hallel thing. And to give you an idea what Hallel looks like, Let's look at Psalm 118, verse 25. O Lord, we beseech you. O Lord, we beseech you. Do send prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You see that? Go back to the verse 12 in John 12, 12. Do you see that? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It was part of their Hallel that they were chanting. Now they were also chanting Hosanna, which literally means, please save us. In context, it's shouting out, please save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But as they were chanting this, it began to sound something different than the true Hillel, and it began to sound like all hail. Not like, you know, a Texas version, you know, when you respond to somebody, but I mean like all hail the king. You get that? All hail the king. H-A-I-L. Okay, that's a different one. So what they're crying out is, all hail, save us our king. And they're acknowledging him as being their Messiah. The one who had been promised to their parents, their grandparents, their great-grandparents, all the way back to Adam and Eve. It's happening now. So considering all that we've heard about Jesus and that he's been doing, had we been there, maybe not fully understanding everything, but hearing and seeing and smelling and all this is going on and this Jesus thing, maybe we would have been there too with our branches, right? It would have been a reasonable thing because we were thinking it's happening now. It's going to be different for us from now on. The hardness of life being under the authority of the Romans and religious people, no more. John 12, 14. Jesus finding a young donkey sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, the king is coming seated on a donkey's colt. So here we start to really get into a um, kind of a problem. Because we think and we're believing that the kingdom to come is happening now right before our eyes in Jesus. And it's going to set everything back to right. Look at Zechariah 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughters of Out in triumph, O daughters of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming. He is just and endowed with salvation. Humble and mounted on a donkey, even a colt, the foal of a donkey. So why is this prophecy so important? 500 years or so before Jesus even gets on the donkey. And there are over 300 other Old Testament prophecies similar. How, when, and where this Messiah thing is going to happen. And at that time, we're part of the Jewish thing, and we know this. And it's happening. We see the colt. But we kind of miss part of the story about what is really happening. Just an FYI. So I, I, some time ago I read one theologian suggested of the over 300 Old Testament prophecies about Jesus, if you take just one, and let's just take this one, 
the probability that that one promise would actually occur in one man as it did is an infinite number hard to imagine. But let me explain it to you this way. The probability that 500 years beforehand that somebody would predict prophecy that Jesus is going to ride in on a donkey is like if you took the state of Texas and you filled it up with quarters about this high. The whole state. And then you painted one red, and I flew a helicopter out and threw it out somewhere in all the quarters, and then gave a blind man one chance to find that one quarter anywhere in the state. That's a probability of one. But there are over 300 which Jesus actually fulfilled. And we know Jesus was a real person, right? I mean, he really lived on planet Earth and he walked on planet Earth. The only question is, is who is he? But let's get back to the donkey. So one of the things that, again, before Jesus mentions about death and not always being here, that's kind of weird because that doesn't really fit into my idea of what this kingdom come thing looks like. Now we're talking about a donkey. And the importance of the donkey is this. In that time and in that place that we lived there, we know two things. Victors and warriors ride a horse. I think about that scene from um, oh, Russell Crowe. He's riding a horse from, uh, uh, oh, I forgot the name of the movie. Um, I'll think of it in a minute. Gladiator. Remember, he's riding the horse, and the horse is, he's so victorious and riding it. That's the one look. A donkey? Not so much. See, because a donkey is a symbol of peace, whereas a horse is a warrior and victory. This is where we start to get into this problem. Because I want the guy on the horse right now in this world, right? I want more like Superman, not so much the guy in peace. I want the guy who's going to ride into town and set it straight and make things right, who's going to bring justice. Because we all know where Superman would have been in Nashville, right? Or the earthquake in Turkey? Or you pick the tragedy? Or in your own lives? This is different. And the thing that's so challenging for us is the Jesus on the donkey being a Jesus of peace is because what we don't fully realize, what's hard to understand is what Jerusalem then and what we deserve now is the guy on the horse. The guy that comes in with all power, all authority, and is going to bring judgment on all rebellion all sin, all independence from God, and he's going to bring the hammer down. That's what we deserve, right? If we're honest. But Jesus comes in on a donkey in peace. And the thing is, he's just getting started on his peaceful mission. The mission that he was conceived for, the mission that he was born for, and the mission that's always been, has been this mission of peace. See, Jesus on a donkey is the king who brings peace and salvation. A king that doesn't need to be feared and dreaded, but a king who can be loved and a king who can be joyfully followed. And I think if we're honest, at least if I'm honest, I sometimes forget and I think we're often like those Jews at that time who are wanting the guy on the horse. Maybe not so much on the peaceful Jesus. I want the guy to ride into town victorious and take care of business and make things right. But we're given a Jesus of peace. And what I forget is that before anything can happen, I need peace between me and God. Before anything can happen, 
I need peace between me and you. Before any right can happen, that has to happen first. And that's the mission of Jesus. And that mission is very different than the one that I understand at that point in time. 12, 16. These things his disciples did not understand at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered these things were written of him and that they had done these things to him. So what we're saying here is that at the time, we're thinking it's the kingdom to come. It's happening right now. But what John tells us is we didn't get it. We didn't understand. What we didn't understand is that we were both part of and participating and helping the fulfillment of scriptural prophecy from thousands of years all the way back to Adam. We were part of that, but we didn't get it. We had a misunderstanding. You know what cognitive dissonance is? That's a contemporary psychological term. Is I'm holding two opposing ideas that don't fit together. And often, when I don't understand, I'm having cognitive dissonance. I don't understand why this is happening, but God loves me. And what John is saying here is, not only did we not understand, we didn't get it the whole time. We only got it when Jesus was glorified, when he rose from the dead, when the Holy Spirit helped us to understand what was really going on, and that all the while that God was enacting his purpose, his plan, his perfect eternal plan. And we were part of it. But we didn't get that at the time. So I wonder, could that be true of us today? I know it doesn't feel like it sometimes, but is it possible that we are part of participating and being a part of the whole fulfillment of God's eternal plan. Now, the key is, we don't understand. Now, I can only speak of me, but when it comes to understanding what God is doing in my life, the, more, the older I get, uh, maybe the more I trust God, but the less I understand. Now, every now and then the Holy Spirit will give me a glimpse. Oh, that's what you were doing back then. Or, oh, that's what you're doing right now. But like a friend of mine describes it as, uh, and Aaron will appreciate this one, he said it was like driving through the cornfields in Nebraska. The corn is going by, you can't see anything, and then you hit a clearing. And for a moment, it's like, oh, I can see now, and then all of a sudden the corn is going by again, and you can't see. That's kind of what it's like. But as far as understanding, eh, not so much. And I'm wondering if maybe... When we see Jesus face to face, we're going to go like, oh, that's what was going on. Now I get it. I wonder if that's possible. But I also, when I read that they didn't understand and that God's plan was being fulfilled and I was there part of it and they didn't understand it, I think it means it's okay if I don't understand it today. In fact, if I think I do understand it, I might want to check myself. Because all I can tell you again, in my case, I'm now 60 years old. I can't tell you how often I thought something about Jesus, and then I learned that, oh, it's way different. John 12, 17. So the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead... now. Some of us, if we had been there and we saw him, hey, Lazarus, come out, and Lazarus is raised from the dead, those people had a whole different experience than, say, the people who came from Jerusalem on the road or the people who came to Bethany to see it because they weren't there. We did. Now imagine what that felt like. You saw Lazarus come out of the tomb after walking by that tomb for about a week. What's that feel like? Crazy, fearful, Great. It's the promise. This is the guy we've been waiting for all this time. And they continue to testify about him. I guess you can imagine, right? If, if, if you had seen La Jesus call Lazarus out of the tomb, and Lazarus came out, and he's at the dinner table with you at the house of leprosy, and you see all this, you'd be pretty excited, right? That's pretty cool. 
The prophecy is happening right now. Finally. And also the people went and met him because they heard that he had performed this sign. So this Lazarus thing is kind of like the, the, the climax of affirmation that it's happening now. That we've been, what we've been waiting for, that my father and my grandfather and my grandfather were always talking about, it's happening now. And it's happening in our midst in Jerusalem. They're enthusiastic because they called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised Lazarus from the dead. I mean, you can feel that, right? I mean, that enthusiasm. And I'm wondering again, like those early believers, insofar as you get those little glimpses of what God is doing in your life and in this world, when you get those little glimpses, how enthusiastic are you? And are you sharing it? No matter how small it is. You can be enthusiastic in your sharing. I have to tell you though, if you share, there's only three responses. A lot of people, when you share, and say, oh, God's doing this in my life. It was so awesome. I saw... They're going to say, you're too stupid for words. That's the craziest thing. It can be explained by science, you know, whatever. They're going to dismiss you. The second kind of people, well, they're going to persecute you. Sorry, that's just a reality. And they're going to hate you for saying it, for believing in Jesus. But then there's a third one who's going to be encouraged, who's going to be supported, who's going to believe more in Jesus because of what you're saying and what you're experiencing. And maybe their eyes are open to what it is that you're seeing and experiencing and feeling. John 12, 19. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are not doing any good. Look, the world has gone after him. Again, a dose of reality. So the religious people were kind of gathered in, kind of divided into two groups. One group, when this whole Jesus thing is going on, they're saying, ah, don't worry about it. He'll fade just like all the others. Because Jesus was not the first person to say he was the Messiah in that time. They're like, don't worry about it. Just dismiss it. Let's just stay focused on our thing that we do in our religion. We'll take care of that. We're supposed to protect that. Let's do that. But there was another group who from the beginning had said, we've got to kill the guy. We've got to get rid of this guy. He's making too much noise. He's doing... He, and he, look, while you guys are sitting around doing nothing, look what's happening. People are actually going to him. And they're starting to believe. So let me ask you, when, when it says believe, what do you think that means? After all, think about those feelings that we've had and what, all these weird things. What does believe mean? I'm sorry. To know that he is God. Okay? Good. Any, any other ideas? Start to realize who he is. Any other thoughts or ideas? To trust him. So, does trust happen here or here? Guess where my feelings are? I mean, my feelings get transmitted up here, but this is where my feelings are too. And this is where trust happens. And they're starting to believe, they're starting to trust. But let me ask you, do they understand based on what we just read? They're trusting, but they don't get it. They're not fully comprehending it. It's like these crazy things like we do baptism. We believe crazily that if you take water and God's word and we baptize an infant, that God enters that person and lives in there and claims them as his own. How crazy is that? It's water. I don't understand it. We're going to do this other thing I don't understand in a minute. Communion? I don't get it. God's with us in the, blood, in the, in the wine and the bread? Uh, kind of weird. My point is that there's a trust going on in me, and I might have a cognitive dissonance in the terms of I don't understand it. And what I'm telling you today is if you don't understand it, welcome to the party. That's okay. And if you grow in the relationship and you begin to realize more and more who he is, you'll, 
every now and then get in a clearing and see, oh, that's what he's doing. But it's not every day. So remember I asked you to try and feel and think like you were there? What that must have been like? I think we're very similar as today's believers. They didn't understand that their perceptions of what was actually occurring were incorrect. And I mention that because sometimes in the littlest things, like a baptism, huge thing is happening. And the littlest thing on you showing up today, a huge thing is happening. You read your Bible, it's a little thing, but a huge thing is happening. Now we in our perceptions and our humanness don't understand it. And when we don't understand, what do we do? We try to put understanding on it. And usually we put understanding on it, it's wrong. And we put our own understanding and it's wrong, then pretty soon we're independent of God trying to do our own thing. Slippery slope. And yes, I know that we don't see Jesus in the flesh. But the Spirit is still present. And He's most certainly at work in our world. He's at work in our families and each one of us. And the work that He is doing is drawing Him closer and closer to Himself. Now, I can tell you that my brother Aaron has been a pastor for a while now. But I'm pretty sure if you asked him, he'd say, oh, still learning all the time. And every time I kind of think I have a handle on it, something new comes. So why wouldn't it be the same for us? And we can recognize that there's kind of this cognitive dissonance that's part of our existence. That on the one hand, I'm trusting. On the other hand, I don't understand. And those two things don't necessarily go together. But the trust part is the part that weighs more. And what I hope you see this morning more than anything is that I need Jesus on the donkey. I need Jesus that is bringing me peace. Not the Jesus who gives me what I deserve. Because, again, if I forget my dependence on the Jesus of peace, pretty soon I'm headed off in a direction that is my own. And on the other hand, when I yield to the Jesus of peace on a daily basis, life is very different. And I'm not suggesting to you that the wrongness and the evilness and the oppression that's in this world goes away. But I am suggesting that when we yield to the Jesus of peace, we begin to have a bigger impact on that world than that world on us. And I don't understand that either because I'm a powerful person. So today, if you don't understand, that's okay. And again, if you think you do understand, check yourself. Because God's plan and purpose is very different than anything that you and I can come up with in our own minds. So then the question becomes, okay, well, if that's the case, if I don't understand and the trust is big, then what is God's plan, purpose, will? Why are we here? What's going on? Now we're going to go back in John a little bit to John 6, verse 38. For I, Jesus, have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Okay, so why did Jesus come? To do what he wanted to do or the will of his Father? And this is the will of him who sent me, that, all, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing. So let me ask you, have you been given by God the Father to Jesus? Yes, maybe, no? Yes? You think he's going to lose you? But raise it up on the last day. 
So guess what the will of God is? That Jesus wouldn't lose you, and that's most certainly true. One of my favorite places in John is when John talks about those whom, or sorry, when Jesus talks about those whom I hold in my grip will not be snatched from it. So whether it's you or somebody you love, guess what? God is holding them in his unbreakable grip. Now you can squirm, you can wiggle, you can do whatever you want, but the chances of you getting out are really, really hard. So if you're worried about somebody who maybe is not, you know, church way like you are, you can trust that God has them in his unbreakable grip. And you can kind of lighten up. <laughs> uh, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. That's the will. Now, between now and then, a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of trust. And remember when I asked you to feel what it's like to sit at the table with Lazarus? Think about this. Someday, you're going to be sitting at the table with, you name the person who's no longer with you, that you love and you cared about, who you just want to talk to one more time. You're going to sit at a table with them, and they're going to be sitting there just like Lazarus was with those folks. And you're going to be Lazarus for somebody else. Can you feel that? And are you able to seal, sorry, are you able to see and feel and receive that even though you don't understand it, that you are part of the fulfillment of God's eternal plan. And, and I know, look, I get it. Some of us are going through things that are just unbearable. Long suffering, never ending seemingly. And in this world, there may not be rest on that issue. I get that. But is it possible that God is working out something eternally good amidst that? Because in a few minutes, we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer, and you know what part of the beginning of the Lord's Prayer is, right? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know what we're praying, right? We're not praying like, oh, I hope God works it out. I hope God can affect his eternal plan in this kingdom. When we pray that, we are praying that his kingdom would come here in me. And as that occurs, the world that we're encountering will most definitely change. And in a moment, we're going to do communion. And in this way that I, I don't even want to understand, I know what the Bible says and I get it, I know what our doctrine says, but I really don't understand it. That immeasurable love that's beyond our wildest imagination, is going to come to us in a real way. So, I'll leave you with that. My last thought is this. And as you come into this Easter Holy Week, and you experience the things of this week, maybe feel a little bit. Well, what, what did that feel like? What does Good Friday feel like? What does Monday, Thursday feel like? What does Easter Sunday feel like? Because those feelings are okay. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. Feelings are not bad or good in and of themselves. But it's okay to feel. So maybe this week as you're going through Easter week, can you feel a little bit? 